Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about the inverse velocity problem for robots that are kinematically redundant, which means their degrees of freedom are more than six. And so the robot has more joint variables that you can change, while all it can achieve in the workspace are three translations and three rotations, so six. So, um, if the robot is not kinematically redundant, let's say it has exactly six degrees of freedom, then the inverse velocity problem is an easy task. And inverse velocity means I give you the workspace velocities x dot, and I ask you how fast I should move the joints so that I can achieve that uh, workspace velocity for the current configuration of the robot. And so, uh, and the amount of the, the speeds of the joints are theta dot. So you say theta dot equals j inverse times x dot. Why? Because x dot and theta dot are related by this simple uh, matrix linear uh, relation, x dot equals j theta dot. And in this case, as I said, your x is a 6 by 1, and your theta is also a 6 by 1. So your... Uh, Jacobian is a 6 by 6, and as long as the robot is not in a singular position, so the determinant of j is not 0, the inverse exists, then you can invert it, multiply it from left to x dot, and get theta dot, right? That's called the inverse velocity problem. But when the robot has more than 6 degrees of freedom, it's redundant. So let's say, for example, for the Sawyer robot, the robot has 7 joints, so this guy is 7 by 1. So your um, uh, Jacobian is going to be 6 by 7. And this guy is not a square, and you cannot invert it. So if the Jacobian is not a square, how should we modify this formula or get anything similar to this so we can find the unknown theta dot? Right? So that is the question. So what do we do here? Well, as I said, your robot has more degrees of freedom than six. It has more degrees of freedom that you need. So not only you can achieve this x dot because you have more degrees of freedom, you should be able to achieve something extra on the top of x dot. You should be able to achieve something extra. Some, basically, some goals, some tasks. One of the first things that typically they assign in such situation is they want the out of infinitely many solutions that exist for theta dot, right? Because now the system of equations that you have here in x dot equals j times theta dot, this system of equations is clearly what? This system is under constraint. You have more unknowns theta dots than you have equations, 6 x dot. So this system is under constraint or underdetermined. And so it has infinitely many solutions. So out of those infinitely many, which one would you select? And one of the first things that most of the people will do, they say, I want out of infinitely many solutions for theta dot, the one that has the minimum value. So they look at the magnitude of the vector, the norm of the vector theta dot, which you can find by theta dot transpose times theta dot, and they try to minimize this function. So if I can achieve the same x dot with... Uh, large values of joint velocities, and uh, I can achieve the same x dot with the smaller values of joint velocities, I definitely want the smaller ones. Because the smaller theta dots means smaller amount of control effort, a smaller amount of electric current and everything that you need. So one of the things we can do, we try to minimize this uh, norm of this vector, and we call it the effort in control. So how can we achieve such thing, and how does adding this extra function will help us come up, coming up with a unique solution, with a unique particular solution? Well, here the goal is, I want to minimize this function, but it is subjected to the constraint that j theta dot should be equal to x dot. So this is my what? This guy here is my constraint. This x dot equal j theta dot, that's the constraint of the system, and this is the function to be minimized. So I combine them together using the Lagrangian multipliers, 
If you don't know about this method, please watch under my playlist called uh, Engineering Mathematics. And then the video is called uh, Lagrangian multi, uh, Multipliers and Lagrangian Method for uh, uh, systems that have linear constraints, like equality constraints like this. So we add the constraint. Now, of course, we convert the constraint into something equal zero. So instead of writing it like this, we write it like that, because this guy is supposed to be equal to what? Zero is an equality constraint of the type g equals zero. So we combine the g function and the f function, right? Or if you don't want to call that g, because here I call the total combination g, you might call it um, h function. So the h is my constraint. The f is the function. I combine them using this unknown uh, coefficient lambda, and I find this g. So the goal is to what? To uh, minimize g. Now, based on the Lagrangian multipliers method, what you need is you need the uh, del of the g with respect to the variable, which is theta dot in this case, to be 0. That means in this case, this entity has to be 0. And then uh, the partial of g with respect to lambda also should be 0, which gives you back your constraint equation. So now the equations I have is one is the constraint equation that has to hold. The other one is the partial of g with respect to theta dot is zero. So theta dot from here is negative j transpose lambda. Okay, so this results theta dot equal negative j transpose lambda. That's my equation one. I can also multiply, I can also multiply both sides of this equation by a, uh, by a j. So what I will do, I multiply both sides of this equation by a j. That gives me j theta dot, or negative j theta dot. I can multiply by negative j to exactly get that one. Right? Equals what? Here it's going to be j, j transpose lambda, which is this guy. And from here, since j, j transpose is a square matrix, I can invert it as long as it's, the system is not in a singularity position. can invert it, multiply it from the left side to the other side, and get lambda, the unknown coefficient. Right? So I get my lambda, the unknown coefficient. That's equation 2. I also have j theta dot equal x to that equation 3. If I combine 2 and 3, instead of this j theta dot, I replace it for x dot. So your lambda is now going to be negative j, j transpose inverse times x dot. And once I have this, I'm going to plug it back into 1 here. So I can find the optimum theta dot. And if you do that, your optimum theta dot is going to be ne uh, uh, these two negatives would cancel each other. And you will get j transpose times j, j transpose inverse times x dot. So this is your uh, particular unique solution out of infinitely many solution. This solution here is your unique solution. And this guy here that is multiplied from the left side by x dot, this j transpose, j, j transpose inverse, we call it the pseudo-inverse of matrix J. We call it uh, Rosepen-Morse pseudo-inverse, and we also call it the right pseudo-inverse of J. Why right pseudo-inverse? Because if you multiply it from right side by J, the result is identity matrix, right? Because J times j uh, pseudo inverse which is what j transpose times j j transpose inverse what is this so here you have j j transpose and here you have j j transpose inverse and of course these two matrices in parentheses they are inverse of each other so the result is going to be i and again, JJ transpose is a square matrix because remember, for this robot, for example, J was 6 by 7, right? J is 6 by 7, and J transpose is 7 by 6. So the whole matrix JJ transpose is 6 by 6. It's a square, and as long as, again, you are not in a singular position, it does have an inverse. So what's the final result? The final result is this. For an under constraint system of equations or for a, a robot that is kinematically redundant.
what uh, joint velocities do we pick out of infinitely many solutions that we can pick on? We pick the pseudo inverse of j times x dot. And that will provide the minimum amount of norm of uh, the, joint, the uh, joint velocity vector. It chooses the smallest amounts of joint velocities to achieve the task. Okay, so here we learn about the right pseudo inverse of J, this guy, and we learn about this um, unique solution for a kinematically redundant robot. Now, before I continue, I want to uh, refresh your mind about the left pseudo inverse of a matrix. Another pseudo matrix that we can define for the J is left pseudo inverse of J. And if you look at that one versus this one, they are quite a bit similar, except that, first of all, the order is reversed. So instead of the matrix times something inverse, it's the inverse times the matrix. And the order here inside this is different. Instead of JJ transpose, it's J transpose J, which is in this case a 7 by 7 matrix instead of a 6 by 6. But still it's a square, still you can invert it. This guy we call left pseudo inverse. Why? Because if you multiply it from the left to J, so this is that pseudo inverse, if you multiply this from the left side to J, the result is going to be what? I again. Why? Because here you have this matrix, which is the invert of that, and the result is I. So that matrix, we call it what? Left pseudo-inverse. So you might say, what's this left pseudo-inverse? I have seen this guy as well in the literature, right? The right pseudo-inverse gave me the unique solution for a kinematically redundant robot. What does the left pseudo-inverse going to give me? If I multiply this left pseudo-inverse by x dot, is that also going to give me anything? The answer is yes. What is that? This is the opposite of redundant. In this case, your robot is not only not redundant, it doesn't even have six degrees of freedom, it has less than six. Or in other words, if your x dot has so many degrees of freedom, your robot has less than those. So uh, you do not have sufficient degrees of freedom in the robot to achieve the workspace task. Your robot is uh, kinematically, I would say, um, insufficient instead of redundant. It doesn't have enough degrees of freedom. In this case, if I multiply this j plus by x dot, you will get a solution again. We call it theta, list, theta dot list squares. What is this? So, in this case, there is no solution. In this case, the robot, as I said, is what? It is, uh, doesn't have enough uh, 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 degrees of freedom, so the system of equations that you have is over-constrained. There is no solution. So if there is no solution, then what is this? This is as we call, called it, we call it list square solution. What does that mean? It means since there is no solution, I can never get the two sides to be equal. J theta dot will never be equal to x dot. I can get J theta dot to be close to x dot. I can try to achieve the required uh, workspace velocity, but I can never exactly do it because I don't have degrees of freedom. So I can at best get it close, and so the difference between these two sides of this inequality is going to be what? It's going to be called a residual term. And my goal is to pick a theta dot so that the norm of this residual, given by the residual transpose times residual, is minimal. So in order to minimize this function, theta dot list the squares, you can easily prove that the solution is going to be what? It's going to be the left pseudo inverse times x dot. So this solution is for a robot with not sufficient degrees of freedom. This solution is for a robot with more than enough, with a redundant robot, or more than enough degrees of freedom. So I just wanted to distinguish here for you between left and right pseudo inverse for J.
Now, what else do we need to discuss? Another thing we need to discuss is, well, your J is uh, not a square matrix, it's a rectangular matrix. It has more rows than columns or more columns than rows. In this case, for the sake of this robot, if we talked about it, it has six rows and seven columns, so less rows than columns. For this robot, the, for this Jacobian of this robot, we can f uh, define something called the null space. And null space is what? It's the set of all vectors, any vector like A. So if I multiply J by A, the result is going to be zero vector. So A itself is not a zero vector. But if I multiply j by a, the result is a zero vector. We say a belongs to the null space of what? j matrix. Because the result is null, is zero. Okay, I talked about the null space of a matrix under engineering uh, mathematics uh, videos. One of them is specifically about the null space and dimension of null space and nullity and everything. So you can watch that. So, what does that mean? What does that mean? If J has a null space, what does that mean? It means, instead of this A, I can choose a theta dot. I can choose some joint velocities. So, if I plug those joint velocities into my robot motors, the result of this, which is X dot, remember J theta dot is what? X dot. The result of that, that x dot is going to be zero, which means what? Which means the end effector is not going to move. So there are, listen, there are some joint velocities that if I move my joints with those values, the end effector is not going to move. Why? Because the robot is redundant. The overall effect of all of those motions will cancel each other. The end effector will not move. So what does that mean? Now that I know there are such theta dots, first of all, what kind of vector are those theta dots? Second of all, how can I use them? Now that I know they exist, how do they look like? Second of all, what's their application, right, of the null space of J? Let's talk about that. First of all, what kind of vectors are going to be in the null space of J? Well, I can show you that. Any vector of this form can be in the null space of J. Any vectors like that, where KH here is just, again, a constant. I is the identity matrix. J pseudo inverse J is a square matrix. And Z is an arbitrary vector. So Z is any arbitrary vector with the dimension that is matching theta dot, right? So if theta dot is like 7 by 1, Z is also 7 by 1. Any vector like that is in the null space of J. You might say, how come? Well, let's just multiply J by that theta dot, see what you get. So if I multiply J by that, this KH is a gain. You can put it aside. J is going to be multiplied by the bracket. J times I is going to be J. And then J, J, um, pseudo inverse J is this guy. But remember, what pseudo inverse are we talking about? When we talked about this, which one is it? Is that the left one or the right one? Here, we are talking about the right one, the original one. Remember, this was just a side note. Okay, this, this area here is just a side note, this left pseudo inverse. This is not what we are dealing with. What we are dealing with is redundant robots, and we are dealing with uh, the right pseudo inverse. We are dealing with this guy. And remember, for this guy, if I multiply J from the left side to it, the result is what? identity matrix, right? So if I go back here, this here is going to be identity matrix. And identity times J is J. So you get J minus J, which is what? Zero. So you see, I multiply J by this theta dot and the result is zero. So this theta dot clearly belongs to what? To the null space of J. Or, again, it will not make the end effector move. Okay, so first of all, this is the shape of those. 
uh, vectors in the neural space. This is the shape of them. Second of all, what do we use them for? We learned that if we add these theta dots to this particular solution that we found that minimizes the, joy, the control effort, if we add them together, right, like this, and call it the total solution, this guy will cause no motion of the end effector. This one is going to give you the desired uh, end effector velocity. So the overall end effector velocity is going to be just the desired one. So in terms of achieving the desired work uh, space velocity, you're good. You can achieve that. But this uh, new vector that we call it the homogeneous solution, and it doesn't achieve end effector velocity, what's the application of it? What do we do with it? What's the application, right? So let's talk about this part. The application is... Since we have more degrees of freedom here, we can achieve something on the top of this x dot desired. We can achieve something extra. What is that? Here, we can define some cost functions to provide us some extra, um, basically, uh, advantages. For example, let's say not only I want to achieve the desired uh, end effector velocity, I want to stay away from what? From singularities. I want to avoid singularities as much as I can. I don't want to go near the singularities. So if this theta dot that I calculate, if this theta dot here is close to one of the singularities, by adding this extra component, I want to avoid the total solution to be near a singularity. How can I do that? Well, here I define a cost function that in one of my previous videos on manipulability, you have seen it, is called the Yushikawa's uh, manipulability measure, which is the uh, square root of the norm of JJ transpose, right? And if this guy goes to zero, that means what? It means you're close to a singularity. And the bigger this guy is, means the further away you are from a singularity. So I want really this function to be big. I don't want it to be small. And by the way, this guy is always positive. So I want it to be positive and big, not a small. So what should I do to this function? I should maximize it, which is maximum distance from singularity. So how do I do that? Well, I choose this theta dot h such that I can maximize this function. Remember, here I have two parameters that I can control. In this uh, form of theta dot h, I have two parameters under my control. One is kh, the other one is z. I have this vector and this magnitude to control. So if I can tune those parameters such that this function can be maximized, then what? Then I can also avoid singularities. At the same time, that I am achieving the end effector velocity and at the same time that my control effort is minimal. So how can I do that? How can I tune the Z and the KH for this case? Well, in general, if the function you are trying to, if this extra cost function you are trying to minimize or maximize, if you want to maximize it, you choose a positive gain if you want to minimize it, you choose a negative gain. And for z, for that vector, which uh, defines the direction of your optimizer, for that, you choose what? You choose the gradient of the cost function, h. And you might say, well, where did you get those from? Well, that's your descent, the essence of the steepest descent algorithm, right? Remember, in the steepest descent, when we want to minimize or maximize a function, we move in the direction of what? We move in the direction of the gradient. That's the fastest direction of going down or going up. Now, if you want to go down, you go in the negative. You go in the negative gradient. For it to be negative, you choose your kh to be negative. 
And if you want to go in the steepest ascent direction, the maximum, you want to go get to the maximum, then you have to move in the positive gradient direction for which you choose what? KH to be positive. Right? So as long as you choose Z in this formula to be the gradient of this function and KH to be what? Positive in this case. That means you can achieve maximizing this function. And since this function is changing with theta, that means your z has to constantly update. So based on the theta that you have, you get a gradient, you get a z. Now if you move a point to another point, of course, j will change, z will change, and... Uh, your particular solution, which is also based on the J and J transpose, will change. So this is only for one specific theta and one specific Z vector, one specific gradient. So this is the cost function you choose and maximize with this formula to avoid what? To avoid uh, singularities. On the other hand, you might say, well, I don't want to avoid singularities. In this case, my robot does not have much of a singularity. I want to avoid the joint mechanical limits. So each one of my joints has a mechanical limit. If this uh, unique solution happens to be close to one of those, I want to add something to make it away from those. How can I do that? Well, here... If you show the joint mechanical limits for uh, theta i by theta ci, so theta i is the ith joint uh, variable and theta ci is the mechanical limit on that, then the cost function that you want to maximize is a function like this. What is this? Here, you're subtracting each theta from its own mechanical limit and divided by the overall range that that uh, joint variable can change. So delta theta is the maximum change in that joint variable. And theta ci is the joint mechanical limit. So here you are changing the distance between your configuration and the limit divided by the whole range of motion. You square it to make sure it's positive and you add it over all joints. If you maximize this, means your current configuration is the maximum distance from the robot mechanical limits. And again here, since you are maximizing, you have to use the same thing. You have to use a positive KH, and again, you have to choose your Z vector to be the gradient of this cost function here, HJ. On the top, you might call it HM. And you can similarly define other cost functions. So the fact that your robot is kinematically redundant is not necessarily a bad thing because it is giving you more degrees of freedom than what you need. So not only you can achieve, as I said, the end effector velocity, you can also make sure that the control effort is minimal and you can also make sure that you can stay away from singularities or stay away from joint limits. And this is your final solution. You add this theta particular that you found here to the theta dot h of this form that I showed you. You add them together, and your uh, kh and z comes from the cost function. And whether you want to maximize or minimize, add them together. And this is the final theta that you pass to the, to the robot motors. Okay, homogeneous solution plus what? particular solution. So hopefully this video was useful to you and you learn a little bit about inverse velocity of kinematically redundant robots. Also, I mentioned a little bit about the ones that do not have sufficient degrees of freedom and the left pseudo inverse. Thank you for your attention. I will see you in the next video.